Hello and welcome to uh, the Auto Limits channel, where you are watching uh, a fuller understanding, where we delve through the filmography of Sam Fuller. Uh, and today we will be talking about his 1959 film, The Crimson Kimono. With me as ever is my role is my <laughs> co-host. I was doing so well. It's my co-host Robert Beams. Good morning, Robert Beams. Hello. Good morning, Craig Ennis. How are you? <laughs> Good. Good. We won't talk about the weather today. So we I'll leave it up to the, the viewers to decide what the weather is doing. <laughs> Mystery box. JJ <laughs> Abrams would love this. Um, yeah. yeah, Crimson Kimono. So when we started doing this podcast, you'd seen a few more Fuller films than I had. This was a rare exception where I'd seen it before and you hadn't. So I'm really interested today on 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 getting your uh, what what you th make of it because so, I think on balance you're probably a bigger Fuller fan than me and this was one of my favourite ones so I'm interested to to get your thoughts. I'm also interested in it in any of the reading maybe you've done around it and some any if there's been any sort of like quotes of Fuller talking about it. Uh, but the you're um, really disappointed <laughs> is it not one that he ends up sort of having much to say about. No, I'll go into that a little bit later, but it is very much skimmed over in his autobiography. Right. That's interesting to me. So what I what I'd say about this one, by way of introduction, is um what's this? The second sort of post Fox full of film? Because I, I think, think the last so. one we watched yeah, was the first one. Columbia right? Pictures. Yeah, let's put it out with Columbia. Um and it does feel kind of low budget. The last one we saw felt sort of like it had a I was starting to see in the in the more recent ones we've seen, they've started to feel a bit more cinematic than this one, and maybe because of the way that this one is um, <clears throat> putting Asian American actors center stage and and having a story about race, which we'll get into. Um, maybe that kind of brings with it a kind of a lower budget in the context of 1959 as well. Uh, but it, it does feel a bit smaller scale, although there is some lovely, um, particularly some lovely like location work in it that's really nice. But like the the really interesting thing about this, I think, this one, is that Fuller from the beginning, as we've discussed on previous podcasts, he's had various films where he's wanted to discuss in one way or another race in post-war America, the idea of uh, race relations. It comes very much to the fore in The Steel Helmet, for example, where you get people sitting around talking about, you, you get these army guys talking in um, in Korea, right? It's in Korea, isn't it? Steel Helmet, yeah. I'm getting that right. They're in the Korean War, and you've got these army guys sitting around, and some of them are Asian-American, you know, this African-American guy, and you start getting this communist prisoner from, you know, communist Korea, who is um, starting to goad them, saying, yeah, but you're not really like uh, treated as equals back home, are you? And that kind of thing. And so you get these elements in Fuller films, certainly at the beginning of his career, before the Fox stuff, which I think a lot of that gets stripped out of. But you get this thing from those films where he clearly is really interested in uh, talking about racism. He seems to be clearly himself like an anti-racist Fuller in the sense that he actively hates racists and wants to make films where he says that these people are bad. Um, so that's nice. But Crimson Kimono is the first one, possibly the only one, because I've not seen the rest of his filmography from here on in, in total, but is the, the first one that really, well, White Dog is presumably about racism, which is one of his later ones. But this is the first one that really foregrounds it. So this film is, is basically entirely about um, racism. It's got, it's a police procedural um, so there is nominally a kind of police thriller aspect to it. But after the first 20 minutes, that sort of becomes a background detail. And what it ends up being about is about the lead character who's uh, an Asian American, like Japanese American cop called uh, Joe. And then his army buddy called Charlie, I think. I've just seen it again. I think yep. he was called Charlie. His, his army buddy, Charlie. Um, and they have a relationship that is, and I don't mean this in a pejorative sense, I got a lot of gay vibes from it. Like they are, they're very so. they, they have this like they have this like apartment that they 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 live in and they bring this woman around later they're like protecting because she's maybe in danger during the case, and that kind of becomes the main sort of um point of conflict in the film because the two guys are vying for this woman's love. Um and it, it, there's this weird bit where Charlie's talking about how yeah this is our house and when when Joe gets a promotion we're really going to put more money into this place and make a real home it's a bit it's it's lovely it's definitely very I like it it's very sexual <laughs> for the time isn't it there's definitely yeah like, in a time when 
Uh, there's probably not a lot of, um, you know, there isn't a lot of films explicitly talking about that. There's certainly um, a sense that these two guys have been nesting together. Yes, exactly. And and so these guys, they 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 base up, basically start off. They're investigating a case where uh, a stripper has has been chased out into the street from her strip club and shot in the in the middle of the street. Um, and they're trying to find out what happened. And they find out. I don't know why they really determined that this is a key lead, but they find out that she was planning to do a kind of vaguely Japanese style strip act in her next act. <laughs> so they discover by talking to the, her manager, she was going to do this elaborate act called the Crimson Kimono uh, that involved her being a geisha and a samurai and a karate man and all these kind of like very generalized sort of like Japanese sort of stereotypical figures in it. And um, from that story, they're like, okay, we need to find out who's um, who she's been talking to about this act. Then that's what they determine. So they start. So they start trying to track down the people she was associated with for this thing, and they they identify that it was possibly that they think um, this Japanese guy who was involved in her sort of. Um, coming up with this act and that he was probably the person involved in doing it but in doing so they they come across this artist who'd seen this guy before um and they ask her to do like the kind of police drawing right of the guy yeah and that gets that gets her in trouble because the guy sees it on tv and she gets a threatening phone call so she moves into their kind of odd couple bachelor pad charlie the caucasian cop who by the way I, this is the second time i've seen it I had managed to completely forget that there were so many Caucasian characters in this film. In my memory, this film was like pretty much just like Japanese American people like doing stuff in like uh, Japantown or something. And I'd completely forgotten that there was this main relationship between these like uh, these two cops. And Charlie is arguably as big a character in it as Joe is for most of the film, or maybe bigger, <laughs> which was slightly disappointing on a rewatch. I, I really thought it was like the Joe show, this thing. But anyway. Um, they um charlie falls in love with the artist and he's uh he's smitten with her and he's telling joe oh she's the one for me gee god blimey i love her and um but when she moves into their bachelor pad uh for uh protection um she actually starts falling for joe and joe starts falling for her and the and the situation becomes one not only of jealousy when Charlie finds out um, and that kind of hostility that kind of interrupts their relationship, but also these kind of racial undertones. And um, what ends up happening is Joe ends up confronting Charlie and Charlie says, oh, you, you know, you're going to marry her. And and there's a look on his face that Joe interprets to be that he's, um, I don't know, disgusted that it's going to be this kind of mixed race relationship. And, and you get this thing where... Um, you know, you can't really chastise a film trying this hard to be anti-racist in 1959 for, for missteps, but you get um, you get a weird combination in this film of it being very progressive because you have the Caucasian woman who chooses the Asian American man, and that's who she ends up with at the end of the film, which is basically I don't think I've ever seen another film from the 50s where that happens in America. Like that's awesome. Um, on the flip side, it's a it kind of is a film about gaslighting people who think they're victims of racism because you get this situation where joe is completely in the wrong he thinks there's racism on his right friend's face but actually mm. it's because he's harboring all this prejudice that that's what he thinks is on people's faces and actually you can kind of read from that oh okay so people who think they're victims of racism they're just reading stuff into people's faces that is, isn't actually there which is is probably not what fuller's going for but is definitely like a reading you could uncharitably make from this film um but i do um, think it's hearts in the right place and she does end up with joe which is nice funny enough he does mention that that's one of the few things he talks about um and he does talk about um joe's preconceptions of how people um perceive him and sort of you know having anger towards caucasian people um but it's the sort of thing where i think if you know if the kind of if the concept of sort of microaggressions and sort of, um, you know, um, sort of diverse experiences or, or, or the place of um, uh, sort of the experiences of intersectional people was a bit more um, sort of commonly known, I think, I think that's the direction he would have taken it if that had been part of the conversation. Do you know what I mean? 
Yeah, possibly. I mean, I one thing I would say is that um, I recently watched most of Alia Kazan's films. Uh, I watched basically almost every, all but like three Alia Kazan films like a few months ago. And um, there's a film Kazan made in uh, 1947 called Gentleman's Agreement with Gregory Peck um, about anti-Semitism that is very much, they don't use the term microaggressions, but it's very progressive in terms of the fact that the film is almost entirely about what we would now call microaggressions and all these subtle kind of coded ways that people are bigoted and prejudiced and racist. And Kazan made a film which has aged maybe less well than Gentleman's Agreement called Pinky in uh, 1949, so exactly 10 years before Crimson Kimono, which is explicitly about a mixed race relationship and a white guy chooses to be with a mixed, uh, a black woman but she's a black woman who passes white and she's played by a white actress. So it doesn't really get that many brownie points. That's kind of why it's really dated. But my point just being that like these kind of conversations about mixed race relationships and um, microaggressions, even if by another name were kind of happening in some films kind of 10 years earlier, yeah. even in an American context. Um, I think where this gets the most brownie points is for the fact that he hasn't cast any white people and given them cosmetics to have different eyes and, you know, done whatever. Because I know again. that's a very low bar. Again. I know that's <laughs> again, yeah, yeah, exactly. But, like, I know that's an extremely low bar to pass, but it's, like, that is what we're dealing with in yeah. movies in this time. And, like, the fact that the film does feature so many Asian-American characters, and it happens in really interesting ways as well, which buck stereotypes, because there's loads of stereotypical ones, right? Like, hmm. the film... Let, let me like it's the stereotype the, film has, the, yeah. the stereotypes is more about the iconography isn't it it's about the kind of it's about the masks and the kendo and and all that yeah. kind of stuff that's where the stereotypes yeah. sort of sit and live but the characters themselves um yeah i, are, I would say it's well, more than that yeah sorry uh, the characters themselves are largely three of sort of racial stereotypes i'd say yeah i i would say for the most part i i think it goes slightly deeper in terms of the presentation of the film with things that have aged poorly where like it has a lot of that like symbol smash kind of music and it opens with like um the credit font is like kind of chinese restaurant font and this kind of thing so there are things about it that are like a slightly dated obviously in yeah. that respect um but what's really interesting is while you've got um these kind of japanese american characters who are shown to be working in Japanese restaurants or doing karate, you know, and all these kind of things that are more, I, I suppose, stereotypical for what they might be doing in, in an American movie. You also get a bit where Joe stops a couple of nuns in the street to ask them a question. One of them happens to also be an Asian American woman. She's a Japanese American woman. So um, you, you get the sense in this film that Fuller is um, not confining people to those boxes as well. Like he's got people kind of across mm. the depth and breadth of society who are Asian American in the context of this film. And it seems to have been born out of a very real sort of desire to, to show that these people are an integrated part of American life and not just a kind of carnival sideshow. But the yeah. film has a certain amount of carnival sideshow. Yeah, I mean, well. it's set in sort of, um, uh, I guess what you'd colloquially called um, you know, Japan town. There's a bit, bit set in, in Japan town in, in as much as you'd have uh a bit set in, in Chinatown or or wherever, mm. do you know what I mean? And there is you do find in, in places places um like that there is much more um outward cultural expression in, in even if that maybe that's something to, especially in London, maybe that's something to do with tourism um and, mm. and you know sort of selling the idea. Um but I didn't rub up too much against some of that because it 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 rung true to me from a from an outside perspective. Do you know what I mean? Walking through, yeah, I think walking through, I, specifically, I'm thinking walking through Chinatown in um, just outside Leicester Square. You, it's yeah. It's, it, there is a there is a visual um, there is like a, uh, a very visual, very public um, cultural display going on um, in 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 those areas there is i think 
I think the 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 thing that's maybe aged slightly poorly though is that if you took it into a modern context and you said, okay, this film happens, it's about racism or it's about kind of Asian American characters and the police force or you know their relationships or whatever, um, and then the case immediately involves like karate, uh, <laughs> you would kind of think like, oh, okay, yeah, they all know karate, and like he he kind of does karate on somebody in a fight scene, so it is it is bogged down in a little bit of what the trappings are for like what an Asian person should, could be doing yeah. in 1959. But it does break out of that box as well, is what I'm mm. saying with like the nun and things like that. Like there are and and Joe isn't really a stereotype. Like there are elements of this sort of stereotypical coded like Asian things that kind of touch onto his character, but he by and large is not that. He is a well-rounded kind of a good character and probably one of my favorite full of protagonists up to now. Like I really like Joe. Well to be, <laughs> yeah, to be honest, he, uh, yeah I was thinking about this. He kind of both of them as well. I mean uh Charlie a little bit less so, but they they certainly seem to be much more rounded than mm. than your average full of lead. Um so, yeah, like, the... so it's quite interesting there's there's I mean, it's very much like you've got the. It starts off very sort of noirish, and you've got the murder mystery, and then it becomes melodrama, and then it dips back into the the murder mystery. But there's, it's got quite a lot going on um, at different points. Again, we, we talked about like in um, Forty Guns, or um, you know, the boat, and in the sort of the last three films we see, there seems to be a lot more psychodrama going on all around it. It's not a straight up genre film, which is one of the reasons actually, one of the things he does talk about in his, um, uh, in his autobiography is saying that he wanted to make a, a simpler film, but it was very much marketed with like very lurid kind of um, posters and taglines and kind of completely miss mismarketed, misadvertised um, by Columbia. And it, it he's he seems very resentful of that in his um mm. in his biography. He talks about it, he yeah. talks about people referring to it as a minor work and that um you know it, he's unhappy with certain things about it, but it seems more that he's kind of been uh, he's a bit gun shy by the reaction to it and that actually um a bit sort of personally hurt by the reception to it which is quite that i think that's part of the reasons why it's so short in his his autobiography it seems like he was making something that that really mattered to him and then the reaction that he got back was he took his took quite personally mm. that's interesting i think i think i can definitely see that all over i'm interested to to hear that because i definitely feel that kind of compromise watching it because um I was looking at the filmography of James Shigeta, who plays Joe. Mm. Um, and if you haven't seen Crimson Kimono and you read his filmography, like his filmography contains films from the period of the names like Crimson Kimono, Walk Like a Dragon, uh, Bridge to the Sun, Flower Drum Song. Like clearly, um, you know, The Yakuza. There's there's clearly a certain kind of role and a certain kind of film title that, yeah. that a, a kind of Asian American actor can be in. And I think if you I watch Crimson Die Kimono, Hard. Was in Die Hard, apparently so, uh, yeah. but like there's a certain kind of role that um, I guess an Asian American actor would be kind of a certain kind of film that they would be accommodated in yeah. back in the 50s and 60s. Um, and you, you did a bit you... more. You did a bit more prep than me. I didn't. I didn't think to do that. I'm sorry. I know you're in the middle <laughs> of a point, but he was also in Mulan. Uh, yeah, he did uh, a voice. Did a voice in Mulan. Um, yeah. Anyway, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I was just saying that, like. I I think that I can see that um, tension with this film in the marketing and in the kind of the way it's the title and everything like that, because it feels to me like a more subtle sort of sensitive film about this topic that has had a lot of that sort of like just kind of put on top of it by the studio. And I, I get that sense. <laughs> from from the quote you just said but just also from looking at it next to the rest of james shigata's filmography and being like yeah it just it just also the title and everything about it just sounds like you would dismiss it if you didn't know what it was right you heard oh there's yeah it's this japanese american actor and you just read out all these film titles of these like schlocky <laughs> exploitative films you would kind of miss crimson kimono amongst all of those based on the title i think uh but it isn't that really at all um I wanted to so, ask yeah. you. Actually, I wanted to ask you as well how you felt about the 
because it is a you know it's a love story with a with a bit of a murder mystery in there. Um, how do you feel, given fully Fuller's propensity to just put two people in a room and go right, you're in love now? Um, how did you feel it played out in this? It's a lot better because the two leading guys in the love triangle are really charismatic and they kind of have a nice chemistry together. And then Victoria Shaw, who plays the, uh, the, the love interest, she's also got some charisma and vitality and spark about her as well on screen. So you get, you actually find, well, at least I, I don't know what your opinion was. I, I actually found that I did give a shit about the people in the film, which is, Again, a low bar, but for a lot of Fuller films, I do not care about the main character. Well, it's often the film. periphery, isn't it? I mean, specifically. Yeah. You know, he's always got interesting characters in, in just about everything, but it's also really in... They're also in the periphery. It's not the it's not the lead. It's not the Fuller lead, usually, that you care about. It's... it's um, uh, what was the one... China game. Like you mean in Forty Guns, like wherever there was like the couple, but they're kind of off to the side, isn't there? Like yeah, and the, the and woman the who works buddy. at the gun shop and the the yeah the, 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 yeah, the buddy. Um, yeah, and the yeah. um and the, the the matriarch of the crime family. They're the interesting characters. Um, actually, thinking about it, going back, it makes Bar Baron of Arizona stand out quite a little bit more as well because he's Vincent Price is really quite um, he's a larger uh, than life figure. Yeah, exactly. Um, but yeah, no, I, I I thought there wasn't, you know, there wasn't any duff performances in it amongst those three. And spe um, specifically when um, Joe and uh, Christine are sort of starting to feel for each other and Joe's kind of backing away, there was a real sense of... Um, there was a real sense of sort of jeopardy or tension within the relationship as well that you you rarely get, um, and yeah, I I, I, was, yeah. I was sold a little bit more actually. I was I was because you know like I say it it kind of um, uh, it kind of um, took me by surprise because I was expecting from what you'd said before police and. I was expecting much more of a noirish kind of um, mm. thing going on. I wasn't expecting this melodrama. Um, yeah, um, I was also expecting what you were expecting, even though I'd seen it before. I'd managed to sort of like, it had changed in my memory into being something that it actually really isn't. I think like the only scenes I remembered from the film, for whatever reason, were like, when he goes after that really big guy in the restaurant and the guy starts chucking everything around and then he, you know, lifts him up above his head and throws him into a bunch of boxes. Like it was that sort of stuff I remembered. And that really cool sort of double team scene where like he's fighting both of them in the pool hall. And then like um, you get some really good kind of dynamic editing of them just like doing moves, like a sequence of moves to like take yeah. him down. Like he's this kind of end boss. Same and, with the kendo. Uh, same with the kendo fight at the end as well. It's pretty, pretty fast and furious, actually. The the editing on the chase at the end when they find the um the the person who is the culprit, basically not because of any great detective work. She turns up in a room with a gun and basically goes, "It was me." And then they chase this woman, and um and the way that the gun fight is is done is really good because you don't see anybody firing guns, really, do you? You kind of you kind of just like hear guns and watch people going like that in front of the camera stuff but it's very rapid um and it's uh yeah i thought it was really well cut together the, the gunfight i don't know if it was like a uh budget situation or something because there's a lot that you kind of just do, don't see that's kind of done in very sort of quick close-ups but I it's mean, uh, again, it's really well done because it's it's brief he doesn't particularly mention like um a lot of restrictions in the way that he has done previously he <laughs> he does again mention uh not getting permission to um shoot in the street and send, sending the um ballet dancer out to get shot and police being called because there was a woman running around in her underwear and <laughs> you know sort of uh run and gunning it a little bit um and and sort of um shaking up people on the street which he had previously done in um uh what was it it's the one house of bamboo um, yeah, so he mentions doing that again. Um, <laughs> so he's still it's kind of even even in his kind of quiet, um, more um, contemplative melodramas, he still has to go out and um, ship people up on the streets. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> which is I, nice. uh, 
It's funny because this is quite a sensitive, nuanced film for a guy who I would sum up generally as not being those things. And but there is a weird outlier and it's a weird outlier as a performance, as a character. And and it just stands out as like the most sample of film thing in the whole movie. So this is character called Mac, who's like a kind oh, of she's a, great. I, can a, I just say before alcohol. you go on to it, before you go on to it, I really got strong Maud in the Big Lebowski vibes when she was introduced. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> she's but like she's the she's the kind of larger than life character around whom when when Charlie's around Joe and around um the Vanessa Shaw character. Um, Charlie is a very well-rounded, sensitive boy. But when Charlie is around Mac, Charlie becomes a fuller, like, film noir protagonist. And the conversations they have, in, in just it's almost like a repository. Like, Sam Fuller had made notes over the course of the last six months when he was waiting for the bus or whatever. He had just sort of gone, like, oh, that's a cool thing to say in a noir movie. <laughs> and then in this movie, he just puts all that stuff on conversations between these two characters when they're like, that aren't related to the plot at all. So I've not written all of them down or, or really any of them down. But I remember, for example, Charlie saying to her, like, you're a pearl, Mac. And then Mac <laughs> being like, uh, <laughs> I prefer things man-made, not made by oysters and all this kind of stuff. <laughs> they have these like, they have these like, banter back and forward kind of noirish conversations that are just like just the rest of the film just isn't like that at all i didn't mind that. her performance is so different to everything else yeah it's a great performance and i didn't mind that it just kind of reminded me about it kind of made me think about a lot of my friends actually and how you kind of what they bring out in you when you're around them so you know if somebody is <laughs> if somebody like i'm thinking very specifically a friend of mine who kind of Basically, whenever whenever I'm around him, the angel and the devil on my shoulders become two different devils, and we just kind of go a little bit nuts. So that I got that kind of um, vibe um, from it all, just because she was so big and sort of brash and kind of that it just kind of brought that out in other people. It did feel like they had a, a, a like a, a much bigger friendship than than is perhaps suggested, like they'd known each other for years kind of thing. Yeah, um, that's the vibe I got. And I don't think that's canon, is it? I think that he meets her in the film. Like yeah. the, the, we see them in a scene and he's like, asks her some questions. And I think she gives him the lead about the woman who's the artist or something. That's right, I yeah. can't remember. Uh, but... <laughs> Um, it feels immediately like these characters are like, like, like he's a detective who always comes to this person on the beat because yeah. you know, she's got the skinny on stuff. Like it, that's how it feels. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I, I like the energy it brought to it, really, because you know, like, like I said, you know, the, these things, these plots that interweave a little bit, and you've got the melodrama, and you've got the, and it just, it was just a nice little bit of levity um, every now and then. Um, I, I really liked it. It was one of my favourite parts about it. What I like about this yeah. film is that it's not, like I say, you know, for Boating and 40 Guns, we started to see these more kind of tonal shifts, more complicated things. But it isn't, you know, it isn't like Run of the Arrow. It's not like a very simple, straightforward um, story or fixed bayonets or anything like that. It's, um, I'm not going to say layered, but <laughs> <laughs> but it is, it's more, it is more, it is much more. Um, it's it's much fuller than his uh, <laughs> than his yeah. earlier films. Um, I'm, I'm sure that maybe it was just deja vu because I've seen this film before. But there's a line in it where Charlie says to Joe that it wasn't his anger about it wasn't because of racism. It was a normal, good, healthy anger that he should be feeling because he's been betrayed. And I'm fairly sure that's something somebody said in another Fuller film, that there's kind of like a good, righteous kind of anger that can exist. It's just normal. He definitely, <laughs> from what we know about him as well and, and, and the tone, he's definitely, you know, I, I'm sure he believes that. Like, because yeah. he is, he's, an ang he's got a real sort of, although his politics, you know, we've talked about him being, sort of damned from both sides and people seeing what they want and him having kind of his own particular take on things. I think he, you know, the, the experience of, of, of the war as well, um, he's got this, he's got a very sort of, he's got a very black and white way of seeing things. Um, hmm. Even if, even if, even if he's not particularly open up to sharing all of that, 
I don't know, even though he's a little bit kind of um, difficult to difficult to read sometimes. But um, and he, he he does get he does always get angry uh, angry about stuff that he sees um, as unjust or morally mm. wrong. There's a lot of son of a bitches in his um, in his autobiography. It's his famous fra- favorite phrase, as far as I can tell. <laughs> the I think verboten sort of summed up how I feel about Fuller. I think when I was talking about verboten last time around, I said about how there it surprisingly got a lot of kind of again like layers to it, a lot of nuance to it, while also being extremely simplistic. And it's really hard to. Mm. I can't justify how it's both things. I can't explain how it's both things. But it it goes into more grey areas and more interesting kind of nuances about the topic than you would expect from how on a very high level surface level it's very like black and white. And, it, mm. and and I feel like that seems to be him as a person, and and that seems to carry across all of his films. I don't really understand how to articulate it, but it's it's just it does seem to be the fuller way. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, like yeah, I know what you mean. It's he's got, but he's got. It's like he he has got a black and white view of the world, but it's at the micro as well. He'll he'll, he'll look at the macro and then kind of really dissect it part by part and say this is wrong um, because of this that and the other these parts of it however are right and your way of thinking about this is wrong and it's like he he dissects the whole thing in as much detail as he can um yeah in his own kind of in a a very rambling way (laughs) i think that's it i think what's happening is that he he is a thoughtful person who is interested in exploring the nuance of the things he's covering but, but he shouts. What? What? <laughs> but he shouts. He shouts it all. But he shouts. But he shouts for one thing, and and the other thing is that um, when he has thought about the thing, he now is just unshakingly sure of his opinion. And so the thing is, is that like, and I think that's it. So I think you've got a lot of nuance, for example, in the things he's thinking about in Verboten, but he is now a hundred percent sure about everything about his opinion is right, and he's shouting it. And that's where the kind of bit that feels like it's not nuanced comes in. Yeah, which is one of the reasons <laughs> why I think his, his films are, are, I mean, they're entertaining, like, for the most part. And um, and that's what's quite, it's a bit like, it's a bit like, like, uh, having a gruff voiced, um, like a gruff voice, um, outspoken lefty uncle at Christmas who's had too much to drink. And it's just sort of going off in a rant in the corner. And um, although you're sort of agreeing with most of it, the way that he's shouting it and, and not really listening to anybody else is also quite amusing. Um, <laughs> is, that, is that a good analogy? Yeah, yeah, I guess so. Although I don't know if... I know this wasn't the one-to-one analogy you, you were going for, but, like, I... Uh, Fuller is definitely not the lefty uncle. He's the he's the he's he's more. I don't mean this as a criticism, even though it makes him sound like a bell end. But he's more in the kind of like Joe Rogan camp of I'm just asking questions. <laughs> yeah, he's just kind of there. I think he's very much someone in the middle, just saying that he thinks everyone's a dick, more or less. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, but in a way that um, can, uh, I think I think the thing like I think the major difference though, you're a dick. You're a dick for thinking this. You're wrong, and you're a dick for questioning this. You're right. Have the courage of your convictions. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think so. And I think the thing that would mark him out against those sort of people who are who are sort of the the I'm just asking questions people is that he he is he does stand by being like anti-racist and stuff. He isn't just going like, well, everyone's got valid points. Like he he does arrive at certain points and go like, no. This is this is right, uh, and you get that sense from him that he's like someone who literally lost friends face down in the mud fighting fascists, and so everything that's about fascists and fascism, he is just like a hundred percent, just like kill the bastards. Like there is no, there is no like, well, freedom of speech. Let's hear them out or anything. He's just like, no, fuck them. Like I literally fought these guys. Uh, you just want to get rid of them. Which That's is true, nice. but also, I mean, it's <laughs> not, but, but then even with that, if you go back to Verboten, he's got a lot of sympathy for the um, people who are being drawn into fascism, who are who are like halfway there, who he thinks can be saved. 
Um, yeah, but once they're all the way there, <laughs> he's, he, he wants to prevent prevention. Prevention's better than the cure, so he wants to stop them becoming Nazis. But, uh, <laughs> but yeah, no, I agree. But that's where that weird nuance thing in the boat I was talking about comes in, right? Because because he yeah. does care about that and he does explore that, but it also on a very high level feels like it could be a kind of propaganda comic book of people just biffing Germans on the chin. So it's very, uh, it's it is very strange in that way and and to come back to crimson kimono like i think i think that's what we kind of see in all of his work and what we kind of see here as well is that he goes into a surprising amount of nuance for things but he's a he's he wears his heart i don't even think he's wearing his heart on his sleeve because i don't think fuller wears his heart on his sleeve but he he wears his opinions on his sleeve he wears his kind of view his attitude on his sleeve and like um you definitely kind of get what exactly where he's coming from there isn't really any there's, I don't think there's too much potential in Sam Fuller's films for them to be misunderstood. Yeah. Well, you say that, but... Um, I mean, like, people will misunderstand anything, but... Yeah. <laughs> and we have talked time and time again about him sort of being attacked by the left and the right, so... Yeah, true. I think, true. you know, I think people... people. I think there's room in his films for people... Uh, uh, well, I mean, there's room in every everything for a subjective reading, an oppositional reading... Um, uh, <laughs> and I don't know if it's because he's shouting at people that they they do <laughs> want to take umbrage and argue against him. Um, but it is nice to to watch these films and think that you're getting, uh, uh, you know, a rip roaring western or uh, war film or noir, and then going and sort of getting that, but also getting a little bit extra on top um mm. and that's i like that a lot i like yeah that me too me too i i am broadly pro i uh <laughs> i really enjoyed this one um i enjoyed seeing it again and and even if it wasn't the film i remembered it being it, it was it was a really it's really good i i do find the that the, the ultimate message of it is that slightly gaslighty one because you have the the way at the at the resolution of the case, right? It turns out that the woman that killed the stripper, she saw a look on a face of the Japanese guy that actually wasn't there, the, 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 the her lover. So, in explaining the case and her motivations to Charlie, Joe realizes the error of his race and that actually all the racism was in his head all along, and that actually no one's racist to Joe. And so, uh, it, it does have that weird message to it at the end. But it, I really like Joe and Charlie's friendship. I really like that Joe is the one that gets the girl and the film doesn't shy away from that and it doesn't like shy away from having them like kissing at the end and stuff. Like it's a film that just goes like, you know what, if you don't like this, deal with it. You know, Fuller doesn't care if you don't like it. Um, or he does care if you don't like it, but he, he wants to shout at you about it. He's not going to uh, change. Uh, so it's, uh, I, love, I love all that stuff. Yeah, yeah, me too. Um, I was going to make a point. I can't remember. Uh, yeah, I didn't get to it, um, and I can't remember what we were talking about at the time. But there was something that you said, and I was going to sort of ex it. It might have ex uh, the fact that his his relationship with his wife was ending at this point um, explained some of it. Um, so if 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 anybody's watching and they remember what we were remember something. <laughs> That would fit with that, then you know. <laughs> then that was the observation. Yeah. And that was the observation. Yeah. So some some of this film probably ties into Fuller was leaving his wife at the time. Yeah. We don't know which parts, but that's some <laughs> homework for you to, to unpack. Um so I, I saw you gave it you gave it a four on Letterboxd in the end. Yeah, I think that was the first viewing four. I think maybe like you like um I imagine you probably knocked it down half a star after watching it. Um, I think that was a, a first viewing for four. And um, I think it'd still be good on a rewatch. Um, I don't know. I think it's one of these films that that might... You know, so there's certain films where you watch them and sometimes you think they're really good and sometimes you think they're all right and then you watch it again and go, no, that was really good. I think there's... I think it's a film that is is going to is rewatchable. Um, 
in a way, you know, like Verboten is definitely rewatchable. Um, Forty Guns is definitely rewatchable, but I wouldn't necessarily revisit uh, Run of the Arrow or House of Bamboo or China. G well, yeah. I might watch China Gate again, but some of them you feel like you've watched it one and done, um, especially in the early. It may, actually, mainly his war films seem like one and done. You've, you've watched them, um, but this definitely feels like it would reward and repeat reviewings. Um, yeah. There was something yeah. that I there was something that I meant to um, mention last uh, time round. I think it was something that I was supposed to um, mention last time round with the voting, um, and that was that he says that um, it was the film that made um, John Luke Goddard decide that he wanted to make films. So next time I watch that, I might have to knock half knock the star off. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Um, what else? Uh, there, yeah, there was a few extra bits. That, like I say, it was very light on the ground, this one, in terms of um, uh, very light on the ground um, in terms of um, uh, uh, content in the autobiography. He does talk about the um, uh, producers wanting to make Charlie less likeable so that uh, to make it okay for for Christine to go off with Joe at the end and him basically refusing to saying, no, no, you know, there's no, it's a love triangle. No, people don't have to be, don't have, it doesn't, you don't have to have a bad one. Um, you know, um, it's just a love triangle. They're all good people. This is just the way it plays out, which was quite, quite nice. I thought. Um, mm. And yeah, I think that was about it really. Um, in, like I say, it was really short, and it, you got I got a sense that he was really felt uh, wounded by by the experience of the um, of the release of it. Um, mm. Yeah, he wanted he wanted to release the original Port Huron statement, not the compromise second draft. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, excellent. Well, yeah, I enjoyed it. I'm looking forward to. The, um, the next one. What is next? Underworld USA. That's um, a great title. It is, isn't it? I mean, <laughs> is it readily available? Uh, I'm not sure. It might take a little bit of tracking, but um, yeah, because when we started this, one of the things that I thought, oh, that's great, was that there was a University of Southern California, I think it was, channel that just had loads of them, almost all of them, uh, and that has since disappeared from YouTube, making it much more difficult to track these down. <laughs> Um, but it's quite. It's it's one of his. Um, uh, it's one of his kind of not quite major work, but it's kind of just sort of sitting underneath those. So I imagine it's relatively easy to get. Um, yeah, but yeah, his titles great: Underworld USA, Verboten, Shock Corridor, Naked Kiss. They're, they're, yeah, the man can pick a title. Pick up on South Street, in fact. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I still want to watch Dead Pigeon on Beethoven Street, even if I think we decided it's 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 unfindable. Um, but uh, yeah, awesome. Well, next time then, Underworld USA. Um, thank you for listening to to us talk about the Crimson Kimono. Hopefully, it's uh, it's one that you can also track down and uh, let us know what you think of it. Um, it is available in eight parts on YouTube. <laughs> It is available in eight parts on YouTube, eight nice little 10 minute digestible chunks. So maybe you can just watch 10 minutes at a time each each day before you go to bed. I think they were trying um, to say Trying to set to Quibi, yes. Yeah, it does seem it is very quibbyable as in that format. Um so yeah, thank you for this as we go on the path next time towards a fuller understanding. We hope to see you then. Thank you. <laughs>